Please open up your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Of course, today or this morning is, uh, is Father's Day. And uh, we, on this special day, it is the most blessed day that we have been blessed with in this country. Um, a day where we acknowledge fathers and we honour fathers, which is an honourable thing to do and a very biblical thing to do. Tragically, we live in a fatherless generation. With a 50% divorce rate, we used to say that 10, 15, 20 years ago, and that uh, used to be shocking. That, that statistic or that percentage hasn't gotten any higher, not because we've become more righteous, but we've become worse. What do I mean by that? It's still a 50% divorce rate, but the reason why it hasn't climbed is so many people are accepting de facto relationships as the norm. So many times as Christians, we um, speak out against the sin of homosexuality and these um, uh, sexual sins that the Word of God clearly uh, condemns as sinful. But um, what we seem to bypass is the normalization of de facto relationships. Uh, this has contributed to many uh, single parent homes in this fatherless generation. And we're starting to see the very nasty fruit of this fatherless generation. If I can just give you some statistics just to um, show you the fruit of this fatherless generation. Um, some statistics uh, are these. 63% Sorry, I forgot to put this on silent. Sixty-three percent of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. What a, a tragedy for a young person, a youth, to take their own life. Sixty-three percent of these tragic circumstances are from fatherless homes. The, the young boy, the young girl doesn't have a, a dad to, to hug them and, and say, I love you and you're doing well. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 90% of young kids, 10, 11, 12, 13, trying to make sense of life, trying to realize what this emptiness within, trying to find importance, trying to find acceptance... <clears throat> but they don't have a dad. They don't have a father figure. Someone that can give them that, that physical touch of affection, that affection of a father that no one can replace. 20%. 85% of all children who show behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. Single parent homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youths in prison are from fatherless homes. Some may say, well, hang on a minute, these statistics only apply to halfway houses. Most of us here are Christians. Well, if I can bring it a bit closer to home, let's look at some statistics where the father was there but wasn't there. In other words, he wasn't that involved. The effects are just as devastating. Researchers at Columbia University found that children living in, two -parent, in a two-parent household with a poor relationship with their father are 68% more likely to smoke, drink or use drugs compared to all teens in two-parent households where the father is involved, hands-on, present. Children with fathers who are involved are 70% less likely to drop out of school. There's a, a website called churchleaders.com and you can see it for yourself. And many other surveys because this has been a, a common problem uh, in church across the board, not to any one denomination. And that is a very high percentage. Most of the statistics put it around 70% of young people that are raised in church, that are born and raised in church, 70% of them, by the time they're 18, 
and old enough leave church, turn their back on church. Of course, each person is responsible. That does not negate personal responsibility, young people. You have an imperfect father, but you are still personally responsible. But nevertheless, parents are still responsible. Fathers are still responsible because our influence is very powerful to good or to bad. Churchleaders.com put it at 70% of those who grew up in church leave church by the time they're 18. Now, though each person is responsible, researchers have tried to find some of the external factors. Like, what is it? What, what are these young people saying to themselves? What's causing them to give up on church? And one of the things that I see most common, and one of the things that I see um, that really touches the nerve, is one of the external reasons why people who grew up in church and then leave is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, that is they see the pastor or they see the deacon as a hypocrite. Like one person at church, that's what a hypocrite is, and another person at home. Or they see their dad. One person at church, but another person at home. I remember when I first got saved, or to use another term, when I first came to Christ or, or became a committed Christian, about 20 years ago, this coming November, will be 20 years. Feels like yesterday, but I remember when I first got saved and got saved from a, like a real sinful lifestyle, and then not long after I got saved, there was a man that came to the church that I was attending and shared how they go in as a group, they were an organization called SLAM, and they go in to, uh, as a group to prisons and share the good news, the gospel, to the prison inmates. And, and I thought, wow, I, I want this. Like, I've come from this kind of lifestyle, drugs and alcohol and, um, you know, this kind of empty lifestyle, seeking for fulfillment, where the only way to seek fulfillment is through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus Christ. So this resonated with me, and I, and I joined straight away and, and joined this um, group and started going into different prisons. And it was a kind of ministry and the, the prison um, system gave us a lot of liberty where we'd go in to the jail yard and whoever wanted to come out of their cells could come out and they would allow us to have a barbecue with the inmates, play some sport with them and then share our testimonies and share the, the glorious gospel message. On one visit, I noticed a young man a bit withdrawn and away from um, everyone, just sitting on his own. So I walked up to him and started chatting to him. And then not long before our conversation, I, I was leading into, and he was very clever, like he picked it up. I was leading to have a gospel conversation. I wanted to tell him about Jesus. There's no secret why we were there. And just as I was about to tell him about God, he stopped me right in my place and said, um, stop, I've heard it all before. I just sort of, I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm a pastor's son. And in all sincerity, I was young in the faith. I, I, I was in that like, cute period of my Christian walk where you know, all Christians are sinlessly perfect. Of course, that's not the case. I said, how is a pastor's son? May I ask, how are you a pastor's son? And uh, what are you doing here in prison? And straight away, he knew the answer to that. And he said to me, these words which really convicted me at the time because we're all guilty of this to one degree or another. He said to me, my dad was busy saving the whole world but he lost his children. He said that with brokenness and tears in his eyes. And on another visit, another occasion, totally separate, another guy started engaging in a conversation with and um, he said to me that he was a pastor's son. I said, what are you in here for? How did, where was the breakdown? Like, you had a, a dad as a pastor's son. He goes, oh yeah. He was one person at church and another person at home. And he said these words to me that like really put fear in my heart. Like a, a good fear in my heart, like struck terror. In my heart as a father. 
He said, at church, he was very friendly and everyone loved him. And he said, as soon as we jumped into that car, his voice changed. He was a different person. That's what hypocrisy is. One person at church, another person at home. But of course, who you are at home, or more so who you are in your thought life, is who you really are. Now, dear child of God, dear father, that Christian father, that ought to strike terror in your heart. Why do I say that? Because all of us are guilty of that to one degree or another. When I heard that, it was the best thing I heard. Oh, I was meaning to preach to these guys, but these two inmates preached to me a sermon. To this day, I have not forgotten and have not stopped trying to strive into practice. Now, have I become sinlessly perfect in the area? No. We're all guilty of it to one degree or another. But as Christians with the Holy Spirit, we're not sinlessly perfect. But as Christians with the Holy Spirit, we live lives of contrition, lives of a continual repentance. In other words, when I stumble and when I fall and, and when, my, um, when I say unkind things to my children... I apologize. That's a healer. Someone who stuffs up and um, repents and continues to repent. That's not a hypocrite. That's a Christian that's striving by the grace of God. That's a Christian that's being sanctified and growing and growing and growing and not sinless, but sinning less and less and less. But a hypocrite is one that continues living their whole life. One person at church, one person at home. morning I want us to look at the power of the influence of a dad yes each individual is responsible for their own actions and there's no excuses not even those inmates could have that as an excuse it's a factor and the dad's responsible for his actions but they can't use that as an excuse as a matter of fact and I said this to these two inmates I've met people in prison as well, and also those who have come out of prison who didn't even have a dad. Met people, know people, even in our midst, that have come from hurtful backgrounds and abusive households and being sexually abused and physically abused. And, and God has saved them by His marvelous grace. And by grace, they've, they've cut that vicious cycle. No excuse. But neither is it excuse. For me as a father, I'm still responsible for the power of my influence for good or for bad. As a matter of fact, Jesus in Matthew 18 and 6 says that it is better for a man to, to tie a large rock with a rope around his neck and be thrown into the ocean than to cause a younger child to stumble, to lose their faith. If you look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, I'll just read the word of God, pray, and preach the word of God this morning. Look with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of, for covetousness, God is witness. Nor do we see glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives 
because you became dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for labor in night and day, that we, may, we might not be a burden to you, to any of you. We have preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would work, walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we are thankful that you are our perfect heavenly Father. That we have a perfect example So thankful that you are a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Lord God, we've all been hurt at some point, oftentimes by our own dads. We're thankful for your gospel that liberates us and gives us grace to not live crippled in bitter lives. but we follow your perfect example and take upon ourselves the responsibility of being a godly father to our own children. Comfort the hurting this morning, those who have lost their dear dads, those who have no dads, those who have been hurt by their dads. Heal them and comfort them, Lord God. And help us as dads, Lord God, to take our responsibility serious that we would Live out the reality of the power of our influence for good or for bad. That we would be able, like the Apostle Paul, to say before you and before our children that we have lived holy, justly, and blameless lives. Be with us as dads this morning, Lord God, that we would love our wives and love our children and that you would strengthen us, Father God, in virtue, grace, and humility. Through the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul was given a, a very rare and unique gift to remain celibate or remain single and not be married. There's no indication that he had his own children, but one thing that we see in the scripture is that he loved God's people that converted under his ministry as his own children. If you look with me in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, the word of God there says, through the Apostle Paul writing to Titus, he addresses him by saying, Titus, a true son in our common faith. And in 2 Timothy, chapter two, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he addresses Timothy as his beloved son, his beloved son in the faith. In our main passage of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul was defending his spiritual fatherhood. He's defending his ministry. Now make no mistake, he's not defending himself out of ego's sake. He's not defending himself for the sake of himself. No, what was happening in this church was he was the, the spiritual father of this church in that he was the, the under-shepherd of this church, ministering to these people. He led them to the Lord. He ministered to them the word of God. And then what happened is um, unsaved people that professed to be Christians crept into the church. Even Jesus had a Judas and started um, saying slanderous things about the Apostle Paul. Even those that, as soon as Paul had come and left, uh, even became uh, false teachers, even started teaching in the church and started slandering Paul and started saying to the people of God, oh, you know that Paul, you know, this kind of idle talk uh, and insinuation. And of course, it comes from envy, strife and envy um, and jealousy because 
uh, what they accused Paul of was in their own heart. And saying things like, oh, Paul's just in it for the money. He's not really in it for you. He's just in it for the glory. Like he just wants to make himself look good and make himself feel important. And that's why he likes sort of to be the leader and be at the front. And they started saying all these things about Paul. So Paul writes, defending his fatherhood. Not because, once again, he's defending himself for his own ego's sake. But he's defending himself for his spiritual children's sake. You ask, how does that work? He knew, and he's right, that with slander, with gossip, with idle talk, that poisons the people of God unjustly. Now, if the pastor's in the wrong, he needs to get hammered. But not through idle talk and slander. Through the biblical way, it needs to be confronted and needs to be dealt with. Talking about idle talk and slander, false accusations, this poisons the people of God. And when the people of God are poisoned and have like a, a, a negative view of the minister that's ministering to them, they no longer hear him. And this is damaging for the people of God. And to help the people of God, he says to them, to cleanse them from this poison. He was confident to say to them, you've seen how I've lived my life before you. You know this is not true. I am right before God and before my fellow man. And this is the same fathers with our children. They're going to have many voices. Many voices. They're going to have um, many non-Christian voices. Many non-Christian Teachers at their schools, at their uni, they're going to have their unsaved or ungodly coaches, their work colleagues, their friends, their bosses, their cousins, their neighbours. They're going to have the drug dealer. They're going to have that um, ungodly girl after your son, the ungodly man after your daughter. They're going to have the Muslim boy after your daughter and trying to flatter, flatter her and I care for you and use all these sort of flattering words and, and they're going to attack the church and they're going to attack, oh, your dad doesn't really care about you and he neglected you. They're going to get the secularist and the atheist. Oh, you're a Christian. That's very oppressive. And um, you, you grew up in church all your life and they're going to say all these things. And if these things are true, they will sweep your son or daughter Easily. That's why young people join gangs. They want camaraderie. They want to be loved. But if you as a father could say, son, daughter, before God and before others, you've seen how I've lived my life. In short, Paul practiced what he preached. And I just want to look at three areas where Paul was able to say, look at my example. Look at my example. And the three things I want us to look at this morning is his holiness, his righteousness, and his blamelessness. Firstly, he was able to say to the people of God, I've lived a holy life before you. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, you are witnesses. This is what we need to be able to do as fathers to our children. Children, you are witnesses. That drug dealer does not love you. He's fooling you. You are witnesses that I have loved you. I have cared for you. I will lay down my life for you. This guy wouldn't even spit on you. You'll be able to say when that girl that you know, parent, is not for your son. Or that boy, you know, parent, is not for your daughter. You'll be able to say to them, no, son. That bad news. The word devoutly, notice in 1 Thessalonians 2.10, you are witnesses and God also. How devoutly. This word devoutly means like how pious we were. Before, you're not like a holier than thou attitude but now that genuine piety most translations including the king james and esv as a matter of fact all translations translate uh, what the new king james translates here devoutly as holy 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 mean meaning pious and so pious we're so devoted devoted to god and to the people of god we're devoted to you to the point of death 
holiness, true holiness. I mean, nowadays, holiness is um, ignorantly synonymous with uh, like holier than thou, like it's almost like a negative thing. Oh, you're holier than thou. And this piety is sort of ridiculed in the day and age that we live in, in, you know, the sort of nominal Christian circles. And outward conformity is a disgrace. That's what turns our children off church. That's hypocrisy. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. True holiness is us turning our back on sin, the things of this world, the ungodly things of this world, living godly and separated lives. No, as a Christian, I'm not going to go to ungodly places and ungodly amusements and watch ungodly movies or listen to ungodly music. I'm going to turn my back on ungodliness. But it doesn't just stop there. As I turn my back on ungodly things, I run towards God. This is practical holiness. And of course, it can only um, happen when, or practical holiness is is an outflow of our positional holiness. It's when God makes us holy. It's when God gives us that, that new holy heart that's separated unto himself. That holiness that comes from God leads us to live devout lives. Devoted to God, devoted to our children. When our children are attacked, the godly father will be able to say, I've lived a holy life before God, and one that's manifested itself in my devotion to my God and to you, my son and my daughter. Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1. He says, for you yourselves know. No, this is not a, like a, a sinful boast. He's saying, you know how much I've loved you. You know how much I've cared for you. I'm saying that you know for your sake. Because you're being influenced by bad people. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. Verse 2, but even after we had suffered... See, the false teachers that were saying, oh, Paul's in it for himself, they were in it for themselves. They weren't willing to suffer for these people's sake. But Paul was, and he's pointing that out to them. This is what fathers do. We are willing to suffer for our children. We're willing to get up at four in the morning and pray for them and and go to work and kill ourselves at work. To provide for them. We're willing to suffer for them. We're willing, without exaggeration, to die for them. Even after we had suffered. Here's what true holiness does. It leads us to a a devotion that's willing to suffer for another. To suffer for our children. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. As you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. We didn't just throw in the towel when this was going to cost us something. They were thrown in prison. He's talking about being when they got thrown in prison when they were in Philippi as innocent men. They didn't say, oh, this is not worth it. Like, we'll just leave this work of God for somebody else. No, they're willing to suffer and continue to give that good doctrine in much conflict. Verse 3, for our exaltation did not come from error or uncleanliness, nor was it deceitful. Verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. In other words, Paul is saying that we weren't man pleasers. We were holy before God and therefore lived righteous lives consistently. Second thing I want us to look at is he could say before God and before the people he considered his children in the faith that he lived a just life. He lived justly. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians 2.10. You are witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly. To it justly means like righteously. Of course, our, our righteous life or our practical life of righteousness stems from our imputed righteousness. It's given to us by God. And because He imputes His righteousness in us, He empowers us to live a life of 
practical righteousness. We live genuine, holy lives in the right path. Simply means to live right. That's what righteous means, practically. The holiness that is before God produces genuine righteousness or practical righteousness that is manifest before man. Of course, if we bypass holiness, that genuine holiness that comes from God, the inward-out holiness will only produce self-righteousness if it's only outward conformity. And that's hypocrisy. That turns people off. But opposite is true when it's a genuine holiness, a genuine righteousness. It would lead us in the right path. Speaking to our speaker who was um, uh, speaking on Friday night, Stephen Chavura, and we went out for dinner after it, and um, I was just trying to understand his testimony, and he shared with me that his dad was a, a Baptist pastor. And unlike that bad testimony of those two inmates... Unlike the bad testimony of those two inmates, he was able to say, my dad passed away 15 years ago, but my dad was a a godly man who lived a righteous life and was a great example for me. I could see that 15 years after dad passed away, that his dad nourished him with much virtue to be able to live devoutly and with conviction, but with such grace, grace, and such virtue. <clears throat> Notice with me Paul's right way of genuine living before man because of true holiness before God. Notice what he says in 1 Thessalonians 2.5 For neither at any time did we use flattering words. He was sincere. He wasn't a flatterer. Never used flattery he's saying. I never flattered you guys but the false teachers that were accusing Paul they were the flatterers. They were telling the people of God what they wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear. Where Paul was telling them what they needed to hear, not just what they wanted to hear. Of course, flattery is false praise to make someone feel good about themselves for the purpose of manipulating them to do what I want them to do for my selfish purposes. That's what flattery is. That's what the drug dealer does. That's what um, the girl that's not interested in the guy but wants something for her sake, like a girl that wants to marry a guy for his money, or a guy that just wants to use a girl. He'll flatter her and tell all sorts of things, just for his own selfish purposes. And this is what false teachers do in the church. Paul's saying, we didn't use flattery, because we weren't interested in ourselves, we were interested in you. And this is a, a father with his son, a father with his daughter. Verse 5, he goes on to say, neither a cloak of, uh, of covetousness. That is, he was not out for their money. He wasn't in it for the money. He didn't see pastoring as a job. Just like being a father is not a job. It's opposite. We kill ourselves to do it. Notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 14. He says, Now for the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I'll not be burdensome to you. I'm coming to be a blessing to you, not to be a burden to you. And he says these words, For I do not seek yours, but you. I want nothing from you, but I want to be a blessing to you. And he says, For the children ought not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. This is the righteous way to do it. Notice in verse 6, 1 Corinthians 2, 6, Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. See, we could have been authoritative because we're the apostles of Christ, but we didn't seek glory. We're not interested in that. We're just interested in you. We weren't using you, Paul is saying, to look good. Of course, false teachers and narcissistic pastors only do it to make themselves look good. To only do it to make themselves like, feel like you know, it's, it's rewarding. This job's so rewarding. Imagine a father doing that. They'll be using your children. 
That would be self-righteousness. Not true holiness. Not true righteousness. It's so easy and habitual to use our children to make us look and feel good. A lot of times we want to put them on show so I can be that proud father. This is embittering to our children. So easy to show them off. And it's so easy. This is a very common one that we slip into um, so easily and sometimes obliviously, but so easy to push them to be the person I failed to be. Well, it's pushing them to be the sports star that I dreamed of or to be the CEO that I dreamed of or to be the doctor that I dreamed of or the lawyer that I dreamed of. I shouldn't push them to be the person I failed to be. I should be nurturing them and encouraging them to be the person that God has made them to be. The third thing I want us to look at, Paul says, or the, 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 that he lived blamelessly or unblameably. Unblame, Look with me in our main verse in 2.10. It says, you are witnesses and God also how devoutly, justly and blamelessly. Look with me in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 2.7. It says, but we were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. He was fatherly, but he's saying, as a father, I still had that gentleness, that nurture of a mother. Gentleness. What a virtue. Our children be gentle fathers, nurturing fathers. Fathers that are going to give words of encouragement. Notice 1 Thessalonians 2 8, so affectionately. Fathers need to be affectionate, gentle, affectionate, so affectionately longing for you. We were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives. Because you became dear to us. Did you hear that? Gentle, affectionate, endearing. You know what? I can't picture a teenager like 13, 14, 15, 16, like going through that, that period that all of us as teenagers have gone through seeking, um, you know, for uh, acceptance, seeking um, to know who they are and seeking the meaning of life and, uh, and feeling that emptiness and seeing, trying to make sense of life and um, wanting to rebel and wanting to run away from home. I cannot see when they go through that. They'll still go through that. They're humans. But I cannot see them going through that and actually wanting to run away from home with a father that's gentle, affectionate and endearing. They will go through that. But when they go through that, then I have a dad that's gentle, affectionate, endearing. That dad will help them get through that period and nurture them. And even if they do go, mate, they will run back quick smart to a gentle, affectionate, and endearing dad. Verse 9, look what he says, For you remember... To the slanderers are saying, ah, the Apostle Paul is a scumbag. He's out for the money. He's just trying to make, using you just to make himself feel good and look good and all the rest of it. No, no, no. But he could say, you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Wow, isn't that what a dad does? He labors night and day for his children. He's able to say to his children, not in a way of boasting, not in a way to feel like, oh, this feels so rewarding, not in a way to you know, um, increase his own ego, but for the sake of his children. No one loves you like your dad and mum. That's a good thing to say to your son. You remember, night and day we've killed ourselves for you. 
Now it's good for us dads to remind our children of, our, of their mum's labor. No one will love you like your mum, son. No one will love you like your mum, daughter. You remember our labor night and day. Paul reminds them that he wasn't in it for the, the money. Verse 8, he says, we, we gave you our very lives. Our children, we need to communicate it to them in our actions and in our words that you're friends. Remember this, young children, on Father's Day and every day of your life, don't seek acceptance from your friends. Your friends won't even visit your grave when you die. Your friends will never love you as your father and your mother. Apostle Paul, because of his love unto his spiritual children, did not want to be heavy. It takes time and energy to care for our children. As fathers, we ought to work night and day to provide Physically, he doesn't provide for his households worse than an infidel. So we do need to provide physically. It's good to work hard. It's good to be industrious. It's good to provide uh, a roof over their heads and, and food and education and so forth. We ought to do both. Both. We ought to provide physically and spiritually to nurture our children. By day, fathers, practically speaking, we provide physically and for their material needs, lest we be worse than an infidel. And by night, even though we are tired and tempted to be selfish and zonk out, we press forward, we labor night and day, and we ought to impart to them our very lives. And by night, we minister to them spiritually. Beloved fathers, we lead them in our spiritual devotions. We lead them in prayer. We lead them in instruction of the Word of God. We bring them to church. We show them the example that, the example being that God is more important to your dad than anything else. We show them what it means when Jesus said, anyone who loves father, mother, brother, sister, son or daughter, more than me is not worthy of me. We show our children by our example how this command by, by Jesus actually makes us better husbands and, and better fathers. We show them by example that when we put our own children before the things of God, we're actually selfishly loving them, not biblically loving them. Our influence is huge, beloved brothers and sisters. What you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. If you give them an example of, oh, I'll just go to church when nothing else is on. Or today, uh, I can't go to church, uh, you know, or Friday, Friday night church. If your children see that you prefer to go to the movies or have a barbecue or um, do so anything else other than go to church. Come on, the early church met daily. They were so moved by the Holy Ghost. They loved God. They loved the Word of God. I don't care what anyone says. When you say, oh, I'm too tired for Friday night church, you are not to too tired for that which you love most. What example are we giving our children? What you do in moderation, they'll do in excess. If they see that you're just a Sunday Christian just once a week and that's it. Well, they'll do in excess. They'll grow up and think, oh, I'll miss a Sunday here and there. And you know the devastating effects of that? Those of you that engage with the world or your child's part of a sporting team or whatever, I engage with the, the parents of the, my son's sporting team and... Um, all of them, like their grand, our grandparents went to church. But then mum and dad, like here and there, Christmas, Easter. But now the kids, the third generation, couldn't even tell you what Jesus did on the cross. 
couldn't even tell you that he was born of a virgin. This is just the third generation. What example, fathers, are we given to our children? If I can just be practical with you, sometimes we try juggle, right? We try juggle, um, you know, church life, and try juggle um, like work life, and we have to do both. We have to work to provide for our families, and we have to put the things of God first. So we think, oh, family, church. Um, and we need to put God first, right? Don't see it as God, family, church. See it as God. See it as a triangle. God, family, church. So the church and family is not second and third. It's God first. And then church and family. Together. Don't separate the two. The church is made up of families. We're communal. We've been plagued with individualism. Learn to do two things at once. Beloved brothers and sisters, fathers, there is nothing better than to take your children to church. Give them that example. Another practical way of doing it, this is the common mistake. You work all week, you're tired, I get it. Tiredness is real. Sunday comes, oh, I'm too tired. And you might still come, but you'll come 15 minutes late. Oh, but your kids see you coming one hour early to the football. Or to the movies. Oh, you, you're not late there, but they see you coming 10 minutes late. Sometimes you say, yeah, but I've been working all, all week and I'm tired. And Well, you know what Jesus' answer to that is? Not neglect your family or your response, God-given responsibility to your family. You don't need to do that. You don't even need to neglect your work. You're meant to do both. You know what you're supposed to be neglecting? Yourself. Jesus' answer to that is deny yourself. Carry your cross. Forget about your sleep. Deny yourself. Carry your cross. You know the truth is, coming on Friday night to church, I acknowledge it's hard. I find it hard. Like physically we're tired. It's night time. But the church, the, the kids don't see it that way. You know why they don't see it that way? Because you've been a good father and you're killing yourself to give them an easy life. They're full of energy on Friday night. They come to Bible club. They're running around in circles having the time of their life. I look at them by the end of it. It's like, it's past my bedtime. All right, enough. Let's go. Isn't that worth it for them to bond in church? If you don't give them that camaraderie in church, fathers, they're going to find it somewhere else. They're not just going to sit at home on Friday night. You get away with it when they're young kids. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In conclusion this morning, <clears throat> the greatest inheritance, fathers, that you can give to your children is not money or houses, but rather that they work, walk worthy of God. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians 2.11. It says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. Not to own more houses at the cost of the things of God. No, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and forfeit his soul? Careful, parents, I've seen this often. Where parents are even encouraging their children, oh no, you got your HSC, you just better study today. It's all right, don't worry about church. Or you, you got you know, your university exams, oh, that's all right, don't worry about going to church, you really need to study for this. What are you teaching them? That university is more important than church? 
Am I saying that we should be ignorant and not go to university? No, we should excel in university. We should be number one in university as Christians with virtue. I'm saying don't neglect it over the things of God. Tell him to get off the PlayStation instead. Tell him to stop wasting time on his phone. Why? Oh, no, no, you shouldn't go to church. They're wasting plenty of time doing other things. Let that go, not church. My challenge is this, beloved brother, brethren and fathers. Will you as a father, as a father figure, vow to sacrifice your life and impose upon yourself self-denial? Impose upon yourself a higher standard so that your children will work worthy of God. This time I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a word of prayer.